Hello, it's Scott Manley here. And the big news is that as of yesterday, NASA confirmed that SpaceX's DM-1 flight will happen on March the 2nd. It's actually more the night of March the 1st if you're in California, or early morning March 2nd, something like 2.38 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, you'll, you'll get the exact numbers on it, but this is the all-important demonstration mission to send a Dragon 2 capsule to the International Space Station. It'll launch, uh, the booster is actually going to land off the coast on a barge, although on paper the Falcon 9 has more than enough performance to perform a return to launch site. They said that they are preserving as much of their performance margin as possible and therefore landing it just off the shore, giving them a bit more fuel in the second stage. And that would be important, of course, if there were astro astronauts on board and they needed uh, you know, extra abort scenarios. It'll take about uh, just over a day, 30 hours, to actually get to the space station and dock, spend five days there, and then return home into the Atlantic. And this will be the first Dragon capsule recovered from the Atlantic. All the previous Dragon capsules have been returned for, uh, have been returned in the Pacific. So this is awesome. You know, this is a, a, a this is something that's been long coming. Obviously, the commercial crew program really is something that started during the Obama era, and you know, Congress pushed back and said, no, we want SLS. So, uh, you know, this is actually one of the things that's really come out of the last 10 years of politics, this transition to commercial spaceflight. And it's finally here. Finally, we're going to see some you know people flying this year. And it's, it's great. Um, also, in the last 24 hours, Virgin Galactic performed a second space flight of Spaceship Two. In this case, they supposedly ran the engine for its full performance burn and they got to 89.9 kilometers. So space in America, not considered space in much of the rest of the world, but the people on board will get their astronaut badges. And this space flight was important because they had a third crew member, a passenger, um, who Beth Moses, who is the lead astronaut or in charge of astronaut training at Virgin Galactic. So not only did she get to fly along as a passenger and we get some great pictures of her looking out the window and being, oh my God, it's amazing. She also got to get out of her seat and float around, which is like the first time we've seen this on a suborbital space flight. Um, that's all very cool, but yeah, it, it does make it clear that since they claim this is a full duration burn, that Virgin Galactic isn't going to cross that 100 kilometer mark unless they've got some performance in reserve they haven't mentioned. Uh, and, and Jeff Bezos has, of course, been making big noise about this, about how his uh, new Shepard will, in fact, go over 100 kilometers. Anyway, back on Thursday, we had the launch of PSN-6 along with Bittersheet. Uh, it launched successfully, but the re-entry was one of the more interesting parts of the booster. The booster was going to land on a drone ship that's about 670 kilometers off the coast, and that isn't the furthest they've ever done it. The, uh, the furthest that they've done it and recovered the booster was Bulgaria sat, but if you remember, that one was extra toasty and in fact bent its landing legs on descent. Uh, this one was going to come down and, and even faster. Now, it's not just the distance that they travel, it's how much speed they burn off before before they hit the atmosphere. So yeah, this was a successful landing and the re-entry video at night was pretty spectacular. We got to see an amazing amount of sparks and heat just from the re-entry coming off. And yeah, they got a successful landing, that's great. Looking forward to the Arabsat Falcon Heavy launch, which is going to be putting the drone ship way the heck out there, like 900 kilometers off the coast. And that, of course, is to give extra performance to that upper stage that's lifting very heavy satellite hardware. And, of course, hopefully we'll have enough speed to still, or enough delta V to slow down and not burn up on the descent. Unfortunately, the attempt to catch the fairings was cancelled. We weren't sure why until Mr. Stephen got back into port, missing two of the arms of the giant net holder. So I'm guessing that they hit some rough weather and keeled over and lost that in the process. As for the question of what SpaceX will do with this booster that's had the hardest re-entry yet, well, Elon has confirmed that it's going to be used in the uh, abort test for the Dragon 2 capsule. It's going to fly as soon as they get the capsule back from the space station and it gets repaired and refurbished. They're going to put it on top of this booster with a second stage that's the right size and mass. It's not going to include an, a Merlin engine. And then they're going to pr try and perform a, an abort. He doesn't expect that the booster will survive, but apparently they're working on, the, you're hoping that it might figure out how to land under this situation. After all, CRS-16 did a pretty good job of getting down safely.
And indeed, Elon's Twitter has continued to be this source of amazing SpaceX news and nuggets, stuff that isn't leaking out via the initial, or coming out via the initial channels. I mean, obviously, this week we've had, uh, you know, Elon and Justin Roiland of Rick and Morty hosting meme review. <laughs> that was interesting. But the most interesting response was when Dmitry Rogozin of uh, Roscosmos cast some shade on Elon's claim that their Raptor engine had achieved the highest chamber pressure. He, you know, he said, oh yes, well we, we have an engine that is completely different design. It, you can't compare gas gas injectors to pintle injectors or you know, all this stuff. And you know, that's all very good, but, but Dimitri, yes, the RD-180 is an amazing engine. Can you please actually use it on some of your own rockets? Because the Soyuz is starting to show its age as beautiful as it is. Elon was really forthcoming in this thread, answering a lot of different questions about random things. I even asked, when they were talking about chamber ablation on the early Merlins, I asked about, you know, pintle injectors, and he did confirm that it makes, you know, hot spots inside the chamber, which lead to grooves getting cut very quickly. And that's one of the reasons they very quickly moved to a much better uh, regeneratively cooled chamber. My iPhone, unfortunately, converted pintle into pinter, and I don't know, injecting Harold Pinter into my Twitter would be odd. Lots of conversations and quotes about cricket, I guess. Uh, but yeah, um, what else? He, I mean, he talked about how he loved the Kestrel engine. He thought it was the Robin Hood of rocket engines, which is nice because everyone forgets the the uh, the Kestrel. That was the second stage of the Mer of the Falcon One, right? They needed a smaller engine than the Merlin for the second stage. It also talked about, you know, really far out there concepts like, you know, antimatter propulsion and Dyson swarms. He was pretty skeptical and pointed out the most important thing is to get reusable rockets for expanding throughout the solar system. Uh, also, by the way, it turns out that NASA is getting $100 million for more nuclear rocket engine research. Hopefully it will be spent wisely. But, you know, nuclear rockets are great for moving around in space. They're not so great for landing things, in particular people, on planets, because if you want to land, uh, you know, a payload near a station or whatever, you can't run that nuclear rocket. If you, you know, Back to the Future, where they have the 1.21 gigawatt nuclear reactor in the back of their DeLorean, that the radiation from that would kill anyone within a hundred feet, given that it only operates for about a second. You know, running a gigawatt nuclear reactor for 60 plus seconds is going to be a really nasty thing to be near. So even if we do get amazing fusion drives and things like that, there's still no guarantee that we won't be using traditional chemical engines for lifting stuff on and off of planets. Anyway, probably the most significant thing that came out of this, though, was the mention that the Raptor engine that achieved that chamber pressure that Dimitri was, you know, dissing them about, it was damaged in that test, and they are currently redesigning parts of it, repairing it. There is another engine that's being shipped to Texas for qualification and testing. So it's starting to look to me like the Starship Hopper is really going to be constrained by getting those three Raptor engines on it and operating at the parameters they need. There was also a really cool video that Elon posted showing the SpaceX foundry pouring, you know, whatever alloy that they're using to make parts of this. I always love watching liquid metal pouring around. It's pretty amazing. But yeah, Boca Chica, they're continuing to build out this uh, Starship hopper. There's a lot more stuff coming out on top of it. We're seeing like plumbing, ground service equipment, and uh, we're seeing also COPVs, pressure vessels, on top of the tank. It's supposed to be an autogenously pressured system. So most people think that these tanks are actually going to be for like cold gas nitrogen reaction control thrusters for control during ascent. Uh, they're also, <laughs> looks like they're building another couple of uh, stainless steel rings and many people think that they're perhaps, you're know, rebuilding that nose cone which has so far failed to make an appearance after it's uh, falling over during the windstorm. But yeah, look, the real big news is to watch out for DM1 launch. It's next Friday night slash Saturday morning. Friday night, I've got a circus, and Saturday morning, I've got an opera, and in between, I've got this historic rocket launch. So I'll be watching that and hopefully getting online to cover it and share it and have a beer and stuff. Uh, also, yeah, we're still looking at figuring out when Boeing will be doing their test flight. Uh, they, I believe their abort stuff is, is almost solved, so we're going to be seeing some updates from them soon as well. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.